show. We are rolling. Okay. This is an oral history interview with Ralph Paul on June 15, 2017, conducted by May Siebel. Welcome, Ralph. We're so glad that you're with us today. Uh, please start by going back as far as you can in your family's history and telling us about that. Okay, on my father's side, uh, and I can go back to 1800, my uh, great-great-grandfather was Aaron Paul, that was his name in 1800, I don't know how far back beyond that, I don't have any idea. Um, he had 13 children, of which my grandfather, Paul Paul, was one. This is a key to my survival. My grandfather had five children that lived. There were two more that uh, still were. Uh, my father's oldest brother, Leo, uh, his oldest sister, Hannah, the third brother, Max, and my father, Eric, and then uh, my aunt, Martha. On my mother's side, I can only go back as far as my grandfather. Uh, unfortunately, when you're young, you don't have the same interest in history um, as you do as you grow older. My grandfather moved to Noyce in the year 1900 and uh, bought a department store there, which he started, a men's and boys clothing store. And uh, I have no idea where he got the money to do this. I'm very curious, but I will never find out because my mother's dead and everybody else is dead involved with that. And when I found out more history of noise in 1903, there was a pogrom in noise. I wonder how my grandfather survived it, but he did. Now, my mother uh, had uh, two brothers and a sister. The oldest brother was named Eric, and uh, then my mother Anna, and then her sister. Martha and, and uh, Willie. Uh, Willie uh, was four years old when he died in a playground accident, uh, so I never knew him. Eric was in the German army in World War I and was killed in action. And it's uh, quite interesting. Uh, I didn't find the pictures, but I had pictures of him when he came home uh, once a year f during the First World War. And it, each picture, as time goes on, he looks more and more depressed. So he knew what his future was. Anyway, um, I grew up in in Noyce, and um, when uh, Hitler came into power, uh, they passed something called the Nuremberg Laws, where, which said that Jews could not go to public school, and they couldn't go to theater, movies, uh, it's very restrictive. And um, so my father, uh, talked to the uh, Catholic uh, people that ran the uh, kindergarten, Catholic kindergarten, and they were not as pro-Nazi uh, as the state, and they were willing to have me attend the Catholic kindergarten, and I did. And uh, it, it was I walked there from my house, and I went with a, a fellow who lived down the street from me, Helmut Cohen, we called him Hello. <laughs> uh, anyway, he and I walked through this park to the kindergarten, and um, 
anyway. Just in case. I was never <coughs> let out to play with any of the kids in the neighborhood, um, some of which was because we lived on a busy intersection since uh, we lived above the uh, clothing store, uh, and then they rented out the third floor. And um, one day, I don't know why, they let me out to play with the neighborhood kids. And a couple of days later, my father and I were walking down the street and we encountered one of the nuns from the kindergarten. My father said hello to her. What do I say? How that work? That's what the neighborhood kids had taught me. They were all in the Hitler Youth. My father couldn't say anything to me because if he said something, you know, a five-year-old child is going to say, oh, my father told me I can't say Heil Hitler. And then there was a law that said if somebody said Heil Hitler to you, you had to return it. So this poor nun had to return the salute. Um, anyway, that was the first and last time I ever went out to play with any of the kids. And I promptly forgot all the, the saluting and stuff. Anyway, then uh, one day, Hello was picking me up and he showed me surreptitiously he found a knife, a pocket knife that somebody had thrown away. The reason they had thrown it away is a spring on it had broken so that the blade just fell out. Anyway, this was a big thrill for us. We were never allowed to touch knives. So we went through the park and we stopped at a park bench and picked up some sticks and started whittling away and time passed and the kindergarten called my father, where's Ralph? And so he followed the path we were supposed to take and found us. We promptly got a spanking at that time in Germany. Any adult could spank any child that misbehaved, whether it was his or somebody else's. And then we went on to the kindergarten. Now at Christmas time, St. Nicholas showed up in the kindergarten. And if you were good, you got a present. And if you weren't, you got a bundle of sticks with which to spank you with. So we all formed a circle around St. Nicholas, and all the kids were called up except Helmut and myself. And by that time, we were already in tears. We were sure we were going to get the stick. So we were called up, and we got a nice lecture. And then he kindly gave us a present after all the set of the <laughs> sticks. And you know, I was a sophomore in college before I ever cut another class. <laughs> That's how effective that was. Anyway, um, then skipping forward uh, to Crystal Night. Now, my, fa my grandfather had a good reputation in the town because people knew that his son had been killed in the German army. By the way, my father, all his brothers and his brothers-in-law all served in the German army. Uh, and in fact, if you've got a minute. Show this later. That's all right. Okay, whatever you want to do. These are some medals that he won. Uh, belong to the Jewish war veterans, it says. Yeah. Oh, the Jewish war veterans. Oh my goodness, the, show you the Iron Cross. He's got the Iron Cross yeah. here. Can I show you this just to show that my father, all his relatives thought they were German. Um, anyway, when Crystal Knight came, um, they did not really come into our house, but they did throw a stink bomb into a store that was underneath where we lived. We lived on the second floor. And from then on, a, um, 
soldier, the, the brown shirt, the SA, was stationed in front of the store and told people not to come in. I have no idea how much that affected the store financially, but um, that happened. Now, after I uh, finished kindergarten, uh, the, uh, because of the Nuremberg Laws, all the Jewish teachers lost their jobs, and the, uh, there's a town next door to Neuss called Düsseldorf, and I tried to find out the population. Uh, I, the population of Neuss in 1931 was uh, 7,888. I could not find out the population of Düsseldorf, but assuming the ratio stayed the same, in 2015, Neuss had 159,000 population and Düsseldorf 612. So that gives you, assuming the ratio holds, that gives you an idea. Uh, anyway, the the teachers that had lost their jobs, a synagogue in Düsseldorf uh, started a school for Jewish children, and. Uh, Luckily, the streetcar from Neuss to Düsseldorf stopped in front of our house and stopped in front of the synagogue. And so at age six, I commuted from Neuss across the Rhine to Düsseldorf um, each day. My father first showed me how to do this, and then I got a, a pass on the streetcar. And um, the I went through the first grade there, and the, every Friday or maybe every other Friday we had gym, and there wasn't a gymnasium in the synagogue, so we walked to a place that they had found somewhere in the country, and I remember distinctly the uh, Nazi youth kids standing across the street and throwing rocks at us with the intention of hitting us. I mean, this was not just a teasing or something. Luckily, they had very poor aim, and I don't recall that they ever hit anybody, but we could not do anything back to them. Um, anyway, the year passed, and then the next year, in November, they had the Crystal Night, and so when I left to go to Düsseldorf, my father said, if you see anything strange or unusual, get back on the streetcar and come home. So I went to Düsseldorf and there was a big crowd around the synagogue and it was up, going up in flames. I decided that was unusual. I got back on the streetcar and went home. That was the end of my schooling in Germany. Now, uh, my father was arrested uh, a day or two after I don't remember the specific date after the Crystal Night, and my mother went to the Gestapo and convinced them that we were ready to leave Germany, and we, she showed all the papers and everything, and so they let them out. But we had a, a certain amount of time to get out of Germany, and um, I have to go back a little bit. My uh, of my thirteen. Uh, brothers and sisters of my grandfather, half of them came to the U.S. in the 18, middle 1800s, and they kept, my family kept contact with the people. Uh, they lost contact during World War I, but then they regained contact with some of them, not with all of them. Uh, and a couple of them had done very well in this country. There was um, a cousin of my father's, Gustav Ephraimson, who had a factory in Indianapolis, a, uh, what it was called, uh, made silk stockings and eventually went over to nylon as that came in. Uh, real, real silk, uh, real silk uh, hose factory, something like that was the name. 
and um, my Aunt Martha, the youngest sister of my father, her husband, Uncle Izzy, was a grain broker, and when the Nuremberg Laws passed, all Jewish grain brokers lost their job, including him, and uh, <coughs> so they appealed to Gus from some and he brought them over to the U.S. And then my Aunt Martha worked to have the rest of the family come over. She contacted Gus over and over until he was convinced to bring the family over. Um, now, the attitude of the American Jews in bringing people over, they liked to bring young people. They were less interested in old people, uh, presumably because the young people could earn a living and they weren't dependent. Um, anyway, so um, they, they brought over uh, a cousin of mine, uh, Alfred Paul, um, more distant, he wasn't the son of any of the brothers or sisters. Um, and then they brought over Aunt Martha and Uncle Izzy, and uh, he got a job at another relative, uh, Louis Wolf. He was related through his wife to the Pauls, and he had a department store in Indianapolis and uh, Uncle Izzy went to work there uh, repacking stuff that they decided to return to the manufacturer. Um, anyway, then uh, they brought Uncle Leo and Aunt Selma over, then Uncle Max, uh, who had stayed in Shermizel, which is the town where my father was born. What years were these that, um, they, that they first started coming over here? Oh. It must be 35 or 6. Okay. Uh, the Shermizel, where my father was born, they had a population of 200. They're really a, a country village. Um, and I remember visiting it a couple of times. And had an outhouse, uh, which is uh, how primitive it was there. And my father went to school only through a grade school in Noyce. Then uh, he became an apprentice in a clothing store. And he went in the army. When he came back, he went back to work in the clothing business. Um, and. Um, worked his way up to being a buyer, which is somehow he got connected with my grandfather in Noyce, who was getting old and needed some help in running the store. And so my father came and then he married my mother. Uh, whether this was arranged or not, I have no idea. Um, it's too late to ask. <laughs> anyway, um, um, then my uncle Leo and his wife came over, and um, it, it started out at that point that you couldn't bring any money with you. So uncle Leo decided he would invest in silverware and try to sell it here. That turned out to be a mistake because German silverware was not in style, nobody was interested in it. <laughs> Later on, when I was working, my, one of my uh, co-workers who was a musician said he knew somebody who came over who was a musician and he bought a very valuable violin which he was able to sell. So there's an element of luck, a great element of luck. Anyway, um, then my uncle Max and his family came over and then it was our turn and at that point this was in 1938, the winter of 1938. Uh, if you brought anything with you, you, you could take 
and my father was a big time smuggler. He smuggled another ten dollars, and <laughs> didn't think we could get by on fifteen dollars in this country. Uh, though fifteen dollars at that time was a lot more than it is today. I mean, I, it's like a week's salary. Anyway, uh, if you had new furniture any, or anything new, clothes, whatever, you had to pay a hundred percent tax on it. If it was five years old, you paid 75% tax, and anything older than that, you paid a 50% tax. And I remember my father making out these big lists of things. And I don't know why, my father bought me two harmonicas, uh, professional harmonicas, <laughs> and I was all excited about them. They got packed up. We came to this country, and we unpacked, and I couldn't find the harmonicas. And obviously the inspectors had stolen them. And there was one last hope. We had a cabinet that some, in Germany all cabinets had locks on them because people had uh, servants at that time. And the key got broken off so that all, just the stub was in there which you couldn't do anything with. And so. I, Nobody could ever open this cabinet, and I kept hoping maybe the harmonicas would be in <laughs> the cabinet. Finally, when I was in my teenage, I figured out if I took a nail, this was a key with a hollow stem, if I took a nail and pounded it into the stem so it was really tight and then a pair of pliers, I could turn the lock, and I opened it up, it was totally empty. <laughs> so that was my harmonica story. Um, anyway, we, uh, when we were leaving, another thing my father decided, since he couldn't take any money with him, we were going to uh, sail first class and might as well spend as much so Hitler doesn't get it. And we were, he wanted to go on an American ship, the USS Roosevelt, to get off German soil as soon as possible. If you were on a German ship, you were still on German soil. Well, the Roosevelt ran aground, so and we went to Hamburg, which is where the, the port was, uh, and we stayed in a hotel at that, which had a big sign on front, no Jews allowed, but the person who ran the hotel um, must have had some sympathy because to get into a hotel, uh, you needed a passport, and um, you see these passports have this big J stamped on them which shows that you're Jewish. So after the Roosevelt ran aground, my father was hustling around to get us on another ship because we only had so much time, uh, otherwise he would get arrested again. And he found a, a German line ship, uh, the Hophug Line Bremen, and um, we got on that. And uh, this was going across the Atlantic Ocean in December, which is a rough time. Anyway, one day out, my parents got seasick and they never came out of their cabin again. <laughs> but being, being uh, eight years old didn't bother me, and I had the run of the ship, which was interesting. I went, I went to the movies that they showed there, and they had some gambling, a kind of horse race where they had horses and you people threw dice. I was just an observer, but I didn't know how, understood how it worked. And, and somebody would bid on the horse and they would win and lose, whatever. Uh, and then uh, on a German ship, they served five meals a day. You had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then a, a snack in the morning, like soup or something, and then in the afternoon, uh, some sweet roll or something, and this was terrific food. And I, 
I was the first one in line at every meal, and there was a band that used to play, and they started kidding me because I was always the first one in line for food. And uh, but the the voyage was fairly rough. I remember one time walking on the deck and. The, an adult man walked toward me and all of a sudden he veered to the rail and threw up over the <laughs> rail. And then one night it got so bad that the sailors came into our cabin and, and uh, screwed uh, big uh, metal plates over the portholes. And my father and a few of the other Jewish men got together and had a prayer meeting that night. <laughs> But we survived it. Anyway, then we arrived in America, and um, we landed in New York, and we, uh, we went to New Rochelle, where there was one of the relatives, uh, again, of my grandfather. Then we went to Baltimore. They must have bought all, as I think about it, bought all the tickets still in Germany, because we obviously didn't have enough money to buy these things. In Baltimore, uh, the woman who was related had just died. We missed, missed her by a few months. But I met a relative of hers there who had been in the Merchant Marine, and he gave me a compass, which I still have. Uh, then we went on um, to Indianapolis, and um, all our furniture had been packed in a crate about the size of this room. And after this crate was standing uh, on the curb, and after we had unpacked it, a, some farmer came by and wanted to buy it for a chicken house, chicken coop. And so we got a little money out of that. Um, anyway, when I went to school, uh, for the first time, I was dressed as a German kid, which was short pants, long wool stockings, and a leather backpack. And naturally, everybody, I mean, that, that was hilarious. Nobody had seen anything like that. And then my uh, Louis Wolf's wife, Jenny, uh, came and took charge of things and got me some normal clothes. And I still laugh these days because all the kids have backpacks now. They've never seen a backpack before. Uh, just <laughs> times. Um, How were you accepted into the school? Well, once I got dressed normally, it was all right. Now, I had a cousin, uh, Peter <coughs> Kahn. He actually was not a true cousin. We were related because uh, his aunt, Selma, uh, was married to my Uncle Leo, so we had an aunt in common that was a relationship. Uh, when I was put in his class, which was a year, he was a year younger than I was, but he could speak English. And one of the interesting things, at age eight, you pick it up very quickly, and uh, whereas my parents, had a lot of trouble picking it up, particularly my mother, uh, who stayed home and, and really didn't have much contact. Um, her contact was really listening to the radio. Uh, so she never really got that fluent in, in English, whereas my father got pretty fluent. Um, and of my relatives, I could see if you came over at my age, say eight or maybe up to ten, you could totally lose your accent. Mm -hmm. If you were, say, 14 to 16, something like that, you still had a bit of an accent. And if you were older, uh, you never got rid of it. And um, anyway, then. Once I learned English, I was somewhat accepted. I was always a little bit of an outcast. And um, then I got to high school, uh, and it was the same thing. The, 
the Jews and Gentiles did not mix. I mean, there was also racial things. Blacks went to a separate high school. We didn't see them. Um, and many years later, my wife and I went on a, a tour of Spain and Portugal, and I ran into a woman who had gone to my high school, which is Shortridge High School in Indianapolis, but who was four years behind me, so I never knew her there. And she had gone to some of the reunions, and I asked her, since Jews and Gentiles in my generation never mixed, I said, what happened when you went back to the reunion? She said the same thing, the Jews and Gentiles sat separately. So. Uh, Did your family become uh, involved with the synagogue yes. in Indianapolis? Yes, uh, <coughs> the Temple Bethel, uh, which was a conservative uh, synagogue. And uh, I got bar mitzvah there and, and so forth. And um, when I uh, left home, went to school at Purdue and got a degree in organic chemistry. And um, then after I finished college, I started working uh, for American Cyanamid Company, their Letterly Division, which was a drug. Uh, drug company, and um, after about a half year I got drafted because I had gotten deferred all during college, and uh, spent, after basic training, I uh, was sent uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, at Robert, uh, Walter Reed Hospital, where <laughs> I analyzed hog urine. Uh, that was because they were, at that time, they were very concerned about atomic bombs landing and trying to figure out triage, what you do to the victims, which ones you can save and which you can't. And uh, since the, uh, what is it, in, in the, what is it, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animal Organization, in, in, SPCA. SPCA, right. They wouldn't let you do studies on dogs or cats, but they had no objection to pigs. And it actually turned out to be a good thing because the pig's metabolism is much closer to humans than dogs or cats are. And uh, so they would irradiate the pigs with various doses of x-rays and then find out what happened to them. And it turned out if, uh, they don't use this terminology anymore, but if they use 200 Röntgens, which is a level of radiation, they, they recovered. Uh, 400, it was 50-50, and 800, they all died. <laughs> it was a pretty horrible death. I mean, they defecated their intestines out, which is pretty gruesome. Anyway, um, then after we had done all the study, uh, they, our group was able to send out uh, some pigs to an actual atomic bomb test. Um, and we sent out a um, lieutenant, or captain, I guess he was, uh, Upjohn was his name. He was related to the pharmaceutical company Upjohn. Um, and he went out and, and they had this test and they brought the pigs back and at first they looked pretty sickly but then they all recovered and it turned out that they had put them in a cage which was uh, had solid metal walls on it so they didn't get exposed to any radiation at all. You know, whole test wasted. <laughs> <laughs> at which point they got out of the army and came back to work and um, the, uh, one of my co-workers who knew me from before uh, said there's a young lady who started working next door whose Jewish and place bridge. <laughs> so I decided to investigate that and we ended up getting married. 
anyway, in about, I, I, I looked and looked, I can't find the document, in something like 1980 or late, middle 1980s, uh, the city of Germany decided to uh, invite back all the Jews that had gotten uh, more or less kicked out. The city of noise, or Pardon me? the city noise. of noise. The city okay. of noise. A number of German <coughs> cities did this, and then eventually noise got around to it. And um, so my wife and I went, and I had an, an I called her an aunt. She was really my mother's best friend, but I had called her an aunt all my life, Aunt Irma, and I uh, told her about it, and she was interested, and she came with us. She was quite a bit older than we were, had an interesting history, too. She, they were very, she and her husband were very late in getting out of Germany, and they went to Luxembourg and then France, and France got invaded and she was sent to a holding camp before being sent to a concentration camp. Her husband was sent before her and killed at Auschwitz, but with the help of a Catholic nun, she escaped from this holding camp and then hid out in the woods for the rest of the war where she met her second husband. Um, anyway, she went with us. And, after the end of the war, my mother tried, and I have some letters in here from her mother showing, to find out what happened to her parents and her sister. And all she could find out was that her parents had been sent to Theresienstadt, which was sort of a show concentration camp, and then they were sent east, and that was the end of it. And her sister, she never found out what happened to her. Well, Noyce had hired a historian um, who, who was able uh, to get a lot more information, and they published a book uh, called Jews and Noise, and he had found out that my grandparents had been sent to a rail railroad siding in Poland uh, and shot, and then my uh, aunt, who could have, she had the papers to get out of Germany, but she She chose to stay with her parents. She lasted a half year before they sent her off. Um, they sent her to Riga, Lithuania on a railroad car in the local Holocaust Museum as a half a railroad car. Anyway, when this, when I went back to Noyce, I was able to contact a woman who had been in Riga. Now, she didn't know my aunt, but she knew of her. And she was too sick to actually come to this reunion, but I corresponded with her, and she sent me a letter describing their transportation and how they were crammed into this railroad car so that if somebody died they couldn't even collapse to the floor, they were so tight. And they stayed in there for well over a week. So you can imagine the place must have stunk to high heaven. And she describes reaching out through the bars, this was in the winter time, and getting icicles in so they could have a little bit of water. Um, Anyway, it, once they were in Riga, they, they were kept cold and ill-fed, obviously trying to kill them. Uh, they, their job was to sort clothes that came in from the concentration camps and then send it back to Germany. 
Uh, anyway, sometime during this, my aunt was uh, died. Uh, this fellow also, they had a little exhibit, exhibit in a museum there, and he had found a slip of paper from the Gestapo <laughs> that arrested my grandparents, which was very emotional for me yeah. to see. Anyway, he also found out, and described in this book, that um, my grandfather was forced to sell his store um, at a greatly reduced value. I think, uh, if I remember the number, he got 30,000 marks for it, which were put in a bank. The bank was hit by a bomb. Nobody ever found the money. There was no record of it. And they couldn't, that was a fair amount of money. They couldn't have spent that in the the rest of the time that they were in Germany, but it just disappeared. Um, now, all the Jews, once he was out of their house, they had to live uh, in a, a, a special house for Jews, and it mentions that my grandfather, my other Jewish men, had to sweep the streets in Germany. I think back of my grandfather, I was a very dignified man, and picturing him sweeping streets is upsetting. How did they find you for this reunion? Uh, there, when the Jews came over from Germany, they started a newspaper called the Aufbau, which means reconstruction. And my parents took this until they died and uh, my Aunt Irma, who survived them, and she lived to 101, <laughs> amazing. Um, my father died at uh, let's see, 85, 89, no, 84, he was 84, and my mother died at 75, but she had a lot of problems. She had had scarlet fever when she was a child, followed by rheumatic fever, which affected her heart. And I remember my wife took her to a doctor. Uh, we had to move uh, to uh, near us, and we lived in New Jersey, and right across, but right on the borderline. They lived in Pearl River, New York, where I worked, and. She took my mother to a doctor, and the doctor told my wife privately that he was surprised my mother was still alive. Her heart was so bad, and she lived about another year and then had uh, congestive heart failure. Um, anyway, the, the trip to Germany was quite interesting. We stayed with, now I have to go back a little bit. So my wife and I visited Israel, and we were in a kibbutz where we met a German, a young German couple, and they were so different from the Germans that I had known. I had always decided I didn't want to go back to Germany because I thought of it as a graveyard. But when I met this couple, I decided maybe we, we should go back after all. And we, before we were invited by a noise, we went back and I actually visited Noyce and saw the building that they had built um, because my the store and, and everything, the building above it was totally destroyed. My cousin Alfred was with the occupation army. <coughs> he actually got drafted in the first draft in 1938, so he spent quite a while in the army here. Yeah, but he came through in the occupation army and he wrote us that uh, the house was totally gone. Um, and another interesting thing about him, uh, he was involved, because he could speak fluent German and English, he was involved uh, with one of the trials. I can't remember the guy's name. Schleicher, something like that, 
who was the head of the propaganda, who particularly had anti-Semitic propaganda. And was a striker. A striker, right. Yeah. Anyway, he had to be a witness at Stryker's hanging, and he, even though he hated this guy, the hanging, he threw up after witnessing this hanging. And, and another interesting story, my other cousin, Manfred, who was drafted in the American army uh, and survived the battle of the landing at Anzio and then in southern France and then finally he got to the Battle of the Bulge and he was hit by a bullet so close to his heart that they never removed it and he also had a hand grenade blow up in his face and he said he was lying there and two German officers came and they were discussing whether they should kill him or not and he could of course understand them and he didn't dare say a thing and finally they decided they wouldn't kill him and they took a toothbrush and cleaned the shrapnel from his eyes and uh, then he was recaptured by the Americans uh, and they did a terrific job on him and he, his face was almost normal. It looked like maybe he had a little acne when he was a kid and they took huge magnets over his eyes to pull out the more of the shrapnel and uh, he managed to survive pretty well. Um, but it was just interesting to find out all these things from, from the sky. How long were you in the service? Only a half year. There was a special deal that came along in 1957 that if you enlisted you could be in for a half year and then seven and a half years of the inactive reserve, so I grabbed that. And you spent <laughs> your time at Walter Reed yes. on that project. Right, and I couldn't have imagined a better place. I mean, it was really sort of a picnic. I mean, Washington, D.C., in those days, this was before terrorism, was just a wonderful place. If an embassy had a concert, you could just walk in and, and listen to it. There were the Marine Band would have concerts on the uh, steps of the Capitol, and uh, just uh, you could go to all the museums. And nothing cost anything. So for someone on army pay, which at that time I think was thirty-five dollars a month, it, it uh, really was. Was good. And furthermore, uh, the, most of the Army people at Walter Reed were officers, and there were so few enlisted men, I was enlisted, that you got to eat in the officers' mess. And I learned to like uh, fried okra and, and hominy and stuff like that. <laughs> but, uh, so I want to trace, you came to Indianapolis and you went to Purdue, which I know is in Indiana, and then right, after well, college, where did you go? You went into the service then. Well, first I went to work for no, a half a year, okay. and then I got uh, those letters that either enlist or you're going to be drafted for two years, so I took that, and then I went back to uh, spent the rest of my career uh, in, in Prover, in New York, but we lived in right across the border in New Jersey. New Jersey. Not very like we were the third house in from the border. <laughs> but at that time the uh, taxes were cheaper in New Jersey than in New York, so that was an inducement to move there. So tell us how you came to Dallas. Well, um, after my wife died, which was in 2002, um, I moved to uh, Needham, Massachusetts, um, because I had, the, had these two daughters, uh, Adrian, who lives in Natick, and Susan, who lives here, and um, they said I had to move near one of them. Now, we had, my wife and I had played bridge in the Boston area and in here, 
and at that time they didn't have a decent club here. We, twice they had a two-table game, which is ridiculous. And so thinking that the bridge was much better in the Massachusetts area, I decided to go to Massachusetts. The bridge is a, a very important part of my life. I, I want to get to that because yeah. I know. I yeah. see you at the bridge club the three times a week I'm there, and you mm -hmm. may be there more often. Uh, when did you take up bridge? When I was in college at age 17. I was a freshman and there were three guys who played bridge and they needed a fourth and they said, we'll teach you. And uh, I overlooked the fact that some of them occasionally make anti-Semitic comments. One of the things which I don't know, I'm sort of half ashamed of, when I was in high school, I knew there was enough anti-Semitism and it kept me from making friends. I decided in college I just wouldn't make a big fuss about being Jewish. And so in my undergraduate career, uh, I just never mentioned anything. I did go to the Hillel, but I didn't make a big, big deal about it. And then when I got to graduate school, I decided I was going to confront people. I was going to put it out there if they liked it, fine. If they didn't, that was their problem. And uh, so, uh, but I remember once, when, as an undergraduate, uh, some they were, people were running for class president, and a guy came around to my room and said, "There are two people running." He said, "You don't want to vote for X. He's Jewish." So. Normally, I wouldn't have even bothered to vote, but then came and said that we want to vote for X. I don't remember his name, but uh, so uh, now I have to get back a little bit to, to the people coming over. Um, we were, my parents and I were the last ones to get over. Uh, they had quotas in those days, and um, we, we were early enough, we got in from the German quota, but my Aunt Hannah and Uncle Arthur, Uncle Arthur had a job at a Jewish synagogue, and he didn't want to leave it, so they waited a bit too late, and they couldn't get into this country from the German quota, and so my Aunt Hannah and her daughter Rita had to go to Italy to come in under the Italian quota and Uncle Arthur went to the Philippines and was lucky he got out of the Philippines before the Japanese came in. Uh, and my grandmother, uh, as I said, they, they were more interested in bringing young people over and my grandmother, who was in her late 70s, had to go to Lisbon to come in under the Portuguese quota. And luckily, uh, Jewish organizations took care of her because she was already old enough that she wasn't totally with it anymore. And um, uh, she eventually came to this country. And um, my Aunt Martha and Uncle Izzy lived in a house next door to us and they took in my grandmother because they didn't have any children. And I remember one time getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I happened to look out the window and my grandmother was wandering around in their backyard looking for the outhouse. She thought she was back in Shermidal and I went out and caught her. But another time uh, I didn't happen to get up and then they found her a couple of blocks away sleeping on somebody's lawn. But um, you were a very brave five-year-old to be taking that streetcar by yourself. Were you? Do you remember being scared at all? Not much. I I do remember a funny incident. You can turn the camera off if you want to on this. I was coming back and as small children 
sometimes do, they forget to go to the bathroom. You were, you were strong, you were feisty, <laughs> they weren't going to get to you. <laughs> I remember one time on the boat, I told you I had the run of the boat, and I ran into some Americans and they offered me chewing gum. And of course I had been brought up, you don't accept candy from children, I wouldn't take it. And they said, no, you'll never be an American if you don't chew gum. And, um, you have a remarkable memory for detail, my goodness. This has been so interesting. Uh, uh, very, very another thing I remember when I was waiting for the streetcars, they had these kiosks and this guy Dreischer had always had anti-Semitic propaganda on them and I remember particularly one that showed a, a caricature of a Jewish face and this guy was holding an onion and the Jews like onions. Now, what kind of, how terrible is that? But to this day, when I eat an onion, I think of that. I don't feel guilty about it, but I, I do think I'm reminded of that cartoon. And I once met a man, a, a bridge player in New Jersey, who looked exactly like this caricature. He had the hook nose and all that. He was the nicest guy. I mean, anybody could make fun of so many of them. It was just ridiculous. But that's what they did. So the bridge clubs, are you going to turn it back on? Or just yeah, it's on? back on. Yeah, okay. Uh, the bridge clubs really grew here after, yes. from what you remember. Right. And of course some of the bridge greats with the aces and everything they, being from here, it was yeah, a big they bridge. Never, they big never bridge come out and you never see them. No, you don't. I, I once, you don't. Uh, I used to play with Soloway, uh, Gold, Goldman. Bobby. Bobby Goldman. He once came in and talked to a director. That was as much as I saw. Uh, so, I, where I, are you? Are you a Silver Life Master, Ruby Life Master, beyond that? Uh, I'm within less than one point of being a Sapphire Life Master. Which is how many points? Thirty-five. Thirty-five hundred. Uh, That's remarkable. That is remarkable. See there, so. so you did you travel to a lot of uh, bridge conventions to the regionals and sectionals and nationals yes, and yeah. everything? Well, my wife liked to travel, and, and so we used that as a good excuse to, uh, like we went to uh, the first national we went to is in Hawaii. Which oh. Yes. Anyway, this is a picture of my parents, and these these are the lower are the parents of Aunt Irma, who were also my grandparents' best friends. Parents were father was very handsome, and your mother very pretty, very pretty. Here, hold that up, my. Rolf, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. It has been so interesting, and we really appreciate the time you've given us. Well, these are these are my grandparents in Germany. They're, they were the ones who were Hermine killed. and Isaac Gottschalk. Yeah. And what is that? Liebgate? Liebgate? Rolf Paul. What is that name before the Rolf? Oh, uh, Leagaba means I lent the pictures oh. uh, to them. Oh. <laughs> and then okay. here is our the store, my grandfather's store. This is the store we and lived here, there. and then they rented out this top floor. Which was very common, I'm sure, in those days yeah. to live above the store. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful building. Well, this is wonderful. That, yeah. uh, and then the um, city of Neuss found a, a photographer who had taken a lot of pictures of people in Germany and uh, 
Oh, this is just just past our, our store is over here, mm -hmm. and this is what the streets looked like. Mm -hmm. uh, Cobblestone. But and look the, at the flags and, and the... Mm-hmm. All German flags. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is wonderful. You've kept so many of these things, and you have them organized so beautifully. Right. And this, this is me at an early age. Oh. How cute. Look at you with all that hair. <laughs> Very cute. I, I had a Israel, <laughs> as they call it. A what? <laughs> you know, the, the Afro and the Israel. Oh, 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 the Israel. <laughs> uh, and um, this was, we weren't big enough in noise to have a rabbi, so this cantor, Nussbaum, uh, ran the synagogue and he was killed. And you were uh, bar mitzvah in noise? No, no. In this country. And, oh, here. Oh, oh, that's right. You moved here when you were eight. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So just, maybe one more. Yeah. This this was for a, a passport picture. Oh, yeah, passport yeah. picture. Something. That's amazing. This is some book. This really has a lot of pictures. Yeah. Wow. Oh my goodness. Nice and nicer. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've had quite a journey. Yeah. Quite a journey. Really interesting. So glad you shared it with okay. us. Absolutely. And